Yeah, I got nothing. I can't, uh, can't go on after that. Thank you so much. Wow, welcome to the show tonight, folks. Uh, this is going to be an incredible show, folks. Erwin Barker is here. Give him a round of applause. Erwin Barker tonight. Yeah. Just, just to do the, uh, the old uh, MC thing, they always, MCs in clubs always ask uh, people, you know, if they're celebrating anything. Anybody celebrating anything tonight? We got any? Are you celebrating something, man? What are, what are you celebrating? Girlfriend's birthday. Girlfriend's birthday? I thought we were in a pretty conservative end of town here. What? Welcome, you're still welcome. Welcome to the show. Wow. And there's three of you though, is that? What kind of? Crazy. What, what's, uh, what's your name, ma'am? Sorry? Kathy, and Kathy, how, how, well, can I ask you how old? Is that just rude, is it? 42, all right. You, don't, you obviously don't care anymore, eh? 42, whatever. Uh, once you hit your 40s, it's all... <laughs> what do I care? No, is it, did they do anything special for you? She's a Clausen. Oh, are you? Oh, why are you embarrassed of that? <laughs> She's not embarrassed of being 42, but I'm a Clausen. Oh, boy. My life is over. Yeah, so you're, you're a Clausen. Kathy Clausen. Was it Clausen? Oh, you dropped that name as soon as, <laughs> as soon as I hit the airwaves, huh? I'm not associating. So, did they do anything special for you? Did you get any gifts of any sort? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Are they? Uh, oh, you're here. Is this? Oh, welcome. Happy. Bir no, we can't sing. We don't have the rights. Uh, have a good one. Uh, well, folks, we got a big show for you, so I don't want to. I don't want to take too much of your time up. So, uh, folks. An incredible act. This is this is the, you know, the second season of, of Comedy Street, and, and uh, there's there's one act that we thought we make we got to make sure we bring back, and that's uh, that's Erwin Barker. So folks, put your hands together for Erwin Barker. Oh, hey, thanks so much, folks. Nice to be here. Great to be here. You seem like a real nice crowd. You seem like a a good I feel like I'm talking to a dog I don't trust all of a sudden. <laughs> good crowd, eh? You're all right? You're good? Eh? You want to hear jokes? I got, uh, I don't know where to put this. I found an earring doing this one time. This. Uh, all right, we're set up. We're ready to go. We got the stool. That's a very important part of stand-up comedy. I don't know if you watch comedy on TV, but they always have the stool. Because comedians work for like a half an hour a day, but we might want to take a break at any time. But just don't underestimate our laziness. That's, that's this speaks volumes. Well, I flew here uh, this morning from, um, on lovely WestJet from uh, Vancouver. And a word of advice to you, uh, pack your own bags if you're planning to go anywhere, because they will ask. It's the first thing they want to know before they even look at your ticket. Three times, though. This lady from WestJet asked me if I packed my own bag. Did you pack your own bag? Yes, I did. And you're the only one that packed your bag? Yes. And she goes, and you're aware of all the contents of your bag? And I didn't say anything. And she goes, sir, you're aware of all the contents of your bag? Oh, I'm sorry. I just thought you were drawing a logical conclusion from the first two <laughs> questions. Uh, I did not pack blindfolded. Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> very rarely surprised when I open my own luggage. <laughs> Turnips, what? <laughs> what was I thinking this morning? Yeah. And I put my bag through the x-ray and the guy's staring away at it going, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, is that an electric razor you have in there? I said, uh, yes, it is. He goes, all right, well, you can go. Like it's that easy? <laughs> Worrying about this guy behind me going, oh, it's just a bunch of cigars taped to my alarm clock. <laughs> I was flying uh, Ottawa back to uh, Vancouver recently and they, they had a movie on the flight. And why do they do this? Halfway through the movie, uh, the uh, pilot comes on the speaker system, comes right into your headphones when you're trying to watch the movie. Uh, attention, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is your captain speaking, uh, Captain Richardson. Like, I'll remember that, I guess. Uh, better write that down. Okay. 
three years later, midnight at Burger King. Can I take your order, please, Captain Richardson? <laughs> I, I never forget a voice, but I don't know. Wow. Oh. <laughs> Things are going downhill, obviously. I won't, uh... oh, well. I figure it's got to be something really important. They're interrupting the movie at, at the most critical point, but he's just taking us on a little tour. Uh, yes, if you look out the left side of the aircraft, we're currently flying over Wawa, Ontario. Well, thanks so much. Uh, he's going on with the weather, the arrival time. Hey, how come they're so unsure about the altitude? Does that bother any of you when you're flying? We're uh, currently flying at an altitude of... Uh, uh, like, just say a number. It's not like we can verify it. <laughs> yeah, that looks more like 34,000 to me. Huh? If I had a protractor and a book of logarithms, I guess I could work it out. Yeah. And finally we get back to the, the movie and it takes a couple of minutes for it to start making sense again. Okay, now I'm following, all right, okay. And then all of a sudden, boom, right into the headphones again. Attention, mesdames et messieurs. No! But, but figure this part out, though, it's like... Better a little low wah wah. Figure, how big is this wah wah? Oh, man. Don't tell me. Have we carried official bilingualism so far? He's got to swing the plane around past wah wah in French, you know? I was in uh, Saskatchewan for uh, Thanksgiving. It was kind of nice. And then I had to go down to uh, Texas. I had to go to Austin, Texas shortly after. And I told them I was in uh, Saskatchewan for Thanksgiving and they just stared at me blankly. Like, uh, th Thanksgiving's in November in the States, you know, for one thing. In Saskatchewan, they've never heard of. They thought I was in some mystical land of the future, you know. Was, where were we? I try, I'm trying to tell them, actually, no, I said, uh, uh, in Canada, we celebrate Thanksgiving in October, and, and you know how Americans can get, you know, they're all huffy, no, 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 Thanksgiving is in November. I think the Bible says it's in November, isn't it? <laughs> Just tell them, no, no, have you ever been in Canada in November? We have nothing to be thankful for in November. <laughs> Just, eh? October, that's when we celebrate it. You should be thankful we even celebrate it. It's starting to get cold already. We've ha had a few skiffs of snow and all that stuff. I remember cold this time of year, most of the time growing up in, in uh, Manitoba. Halloween, every costume involves a toque. I remember that. <laughs> feel so lame. Oh, it's a ghost in a toque. <laughs> what, a witch in a toque. That's nice. Yeah, great. <laughs> great. Out in the farm, I remember one year... Uh, my sister and I out at the farm Thanksgiving, remember that? Hey, we were out nine hours altogether. We went to five houses. <laughs> Come back, I got a pail of milk and a cabbage. <laughs> it's a bunch of carrots, oh, this is lame, this is great. Yeah, Halloween on the farm, that's great. I remember one year my aunt and uncle, they sent me out as a wily coyote, uh, very popular with the farm dogs. Huh? <laughs> Every house you go to, it's a coyote, get him! Ah. Don't let the toque fool you, it's a coyote, I know coyotes. <laughs> They're crazy, the dogs at the farm. I, my, I have my family here, so I'm, I'm uh, remembering <laughs> the, the farm dog. We, uh, my aunt and uncle, Butch, remember Butch? Oh, scared to death of that dog. He was one of those, uh, you know, farm dog, kind of guard dog, half mutant wolverine. He had this <laughs> ear ripped off in a fight with a badger. I was scared to death of him, just scared to death. And my uncle, he'd always say the most reassuring things I hear, don't be afraid because he can smell fear. <laughs> if he smells fear, he'll rip your throat out. Now pet him. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Remember that? My aunt always saying things. Well, he thinks you're a burglar. That's what burglars do in the country. Families of burglars arrive in the middle of the day. Come running up the driveway. No, 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 no. He thinks I'm a burger. That's what he thinks. Yeah. Butch. Yeah. He, he wouldn't listen to anyone but Uncle Fred. Remember that? Butch. 
and Uncle, he'd send them out to, to uh, round up cattle and uh, he'd take the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Head hanging out the window. All right, get in the car, get in the, get in the barn. All right, I see you there, Daisy. Don't hide behind the tree. Don't make me get out of the truck. <laughs> Remember, I used to wonder when I was a kid, I used to figure the cows must have hated that dog, don't you think? I, I just, I, I used to think they'd be out there grazing and one of them would kind of click in You just realize, you know, I was thinking there's uh, 37 of us. <laughs> there's only one of him, right? We must weigh, what, 1,500 pounds each? I think we could take them, you know that? <laughs> Never occurs to them. It'd be funny to see, wouldn't it? A couple of cows just hanging a beating on the dog behind the barn. <laughs> Body slam him, Daisy. Flank. <laughs> I don't even know how cows communicate. I guess charades is out of the question. Eh? Two words, second word, two syllables. These hooves are useless. Eh? I mean, nothing here. Puffed wheat, remember choking that stuff down in the morning? That's like eating brown air, huh? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Every Saturday morning, eh, my dad opened the trunk of the car, lugged this thing the size of a peat moss bag over his shoulder, <laughs> stumbling into the house. The rest of the neighborhood pointing over the fence, poor family, poor family. <laughs> we weren't uh, really poor, but we were Pentecostal, so we had to pretend we were poor. <laughs> Puffed wheat. You ever pour milk on that stuff? The puffed wheat just leaps right out of the bowl. Huh? They should be using it for stuffing life jackets. Uh, it's the only food you can have nine bowls of it in your lighter afterwards. <laughs> boing, boing, boing. My, uh, my other sister, uh, uh, her, uh, her husband's a, a karate expert. And uh, do you know anyone who's a, a black belt in... Uh, Karate. Do they, are they all the same way? Like every conversation we have, he's got to twist it around to some other way that he could kill me with his thumb. You know, <laughs> just you walk in the front door of the house. He says, "Okay, poke me in the eye with a stick." Yeah, I'd like to. I'll wait till you're sleeping on the couch, though. If that's all right. Pink. <laughs> Karate's good, but it doesn't work when you're sleeping. You know? But yeah, you know, family gatherings, and he's strutting around the living room doing the uh, kata, right? The, Call it with the breathing. Fwa, ha, ha. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, he's going, you must be prepared at all times. Yeah, right, like Aunt Audrey's going to fake for the tea and roundhouse you. <laughs> it's like, we're family. You're going to have to start trusting us, all right? Uh, but uh, no, we were at, at, at the dinner, and he's had this scenario concocted in his head about how I need to learn to defend myself in case of a robbery. He's going, okay, you're at a bus stop. Some guy grabs you by the collar. He's got a knife in your throat. He wants your wallet. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to... I'm, I'm going to give him my wallet. <laughs> He's got a knife. I got a wallet. That's fair, isn't it? That's how it works. I'm not going to practice eight hours a day on the outside chance someone's going to try to rob me once. I'm not going to wear a helmet so I don't get hit by a meteorite either. I got to... Working on probabilities here. But he's explaining the moves to me. He tells me as soon as the guy lunges the knife towards your heart, at the exact right second, give him the rising block so I can picture my hand and wrist flopping around on the sidewalk now. <laughs> now what? You, you gotta hope the guy's squeamish. Hey, here's a stump there for you, buddy. <laughs> Take that grizzly nightmare home with you, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'd love to give you my wallet, but you've taken care of that, haven't you? Know, huh? <laughs> a lot of good it's doing either of us down here, yeah? No, he says, you smack the guy in the temple with the back of your knuckles. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then spin through the air. That's what he says. Spin through the air. Hit the guy right behind the ear with the back of your heel. All right. And then fly away after. Uh, I can't do that. It's useless advice. I'm incapable. You might as well just tell me to look around, see if he's got a paper cut and squeeze lemon juice on it. <laughs> Uh, it is thrilling to see animals out in the wild, too. I, I was driving from uh, Calgary to Banff a little while ago, and I saw a bear, a grizzly bear, in the ditch. And uh, I got to the park gate, and there was a sign that says to uh, report any bears. So I squealed on this bear. I felt bad, because they were all over me. They were up and down, like, which way? Was he heading east? You know, was he standing? I don't know. I think he had something in his pocket. That's all I remember. <laughs> Uh, I think he had a grappling hook. 
I don't know much about wildlife. I just, I, I didn't think to stop the car and ask, what are you doing, buddy, back in the woods? But they give you a brochure. You get, you get to uh, Banff, you're in bear country, uh, how to avoid an encounter with a grizzly bear. And uh, one of the things it said, I remember this, it said when you're selecting a, a picnic site, uh, try to avoid any area where there are fresh bear droppings. <laughs> well, I'll try, but uh, you, know, you know what it's like. You know, you come to a meadow full of bear droppings. What do you say we spread the blanket here? This is great. I don't know. Perfect. This is lovely here. This is great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, throw that salmon in the tent. Oh. Oh, hey, there's a cub. Take a picture of me giving him a headlock, if I can... Oh, he's gone into the blueberries. I'll get him. Get a picture of me. It says if you're uh, approached uh, by a bear, you should uh, play dead. Uh, approached. That's an interesting choice of words. That's typical Canadian government, uh, trying to soften anything bad that might happen to us. Approached. Like the bear is going to be, uh, excuse me. But I live here. You're in my bathroom, in fact. If you're uh, approached by a bear, you should uh, play dead. I just wonder what kind of a complex the poor bear in the park's developing over this. Everyone I try to talk to dies. Is it my breath? Is that what it is? It's, it's my approach, isn't it? Healthy hikers die when I appear. That's wrong. I... Actually, the dumb part of the brochure says, uh, carry a cell phone with you in case you're out hiking and you're lost. You're approached by a bear. You can call for help. I don't know. If that... Would that work? Hello, can I speak to the park ranger, please? You're in serious trouble here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, how long will he be, though? Huh? How long does he take for lunch? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Just speaking of lunch, I, I'm, um, seems I'm being approached by a bear. <laughs> Where are you? I have no idea. I'm lost. <laughs> Obviously, I'm in bear country. <laughs> Actually, more realistically, if you call, it'll be something like a, thank you for calling Parks Canada. If you're being approached by a bear, press one. <laughs> Your life-threatening emergency is important to us. <laughs> and will be answered in the order it was received. <laughs> For faster service, please consult our website at www.savagemalling.ca. <laughs> Switches into the music. This is the last song I'll ever write for you. <laughs> like, that's how you can tell it's bear droppings. It's got pieces of cell phone in it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I saw this one. Uh, I was on the pink flamingo. It was kind of cracking me up. The narrator guy's going, uh, the pink flamingo, keeping an ever vigilant eye for predators. I'm thinking, well, no wonder. He's bright pink. Huh? <laughs> this, this poor bird, his whole life is, oh, this is no good. I, I'm, I'm the wrong color. I didn't fare very well in the camouflage. Well, look, I'm in hot pink. I'm hot pink. Why, why couldn't God have just made my bird call into ta-da, dinner? Yeah, looking around for construction sites so he can hide up against the insulation. Where did I go, huh? I was watching this thing a little while ago. It was uh, this special about uh, ducks. This uh, scientist by the name of uh, Conrad Lorenz uh, discovered that uh, ducks will follow the first thing they see when they, when they hatch, a process that he called uh, imprinting, a process that prairie farmers refer to as common knowledge. <laughs> but uh, Conrad Lorenz, he won a huge scientific award for his work too. And it, that, it, was it a slow day or something in the scientific community? <laughs> was that what it was out there at their meetings? Any new discoveries, any, any elements? Uh, anyone figured a way to save the planet from certain destruction? Nothing? It's, uh, they're counting. Yes, Conrad, at the back, what do you got? <laughs> Ducks follow the first thing they see when... They, you know what, come on up and get a prize. Eh? Maybe <laughs> get some of you guys working here. It's comical to see because Conrad Lorenzi wanders around his compound and there's these 
four ducks that just follow him everywhere he goes. And it's, it's funny to me because they, they don't realize they're ducks. You know, they think they're distinguished biologists now. <laughs> oh, lovely day, isn't it? Yes. Why is he making orange sauce? <laughs> animal rights, that's huge too in Vancouver. Man alive, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting an animal rights uh, <laughs> activist. Uh, animal rights there, they're huge on it. The free range chicken, that's the thing. That, this people, they're willing to pay extra money so a chicken can have a better life. Right? They'll, they'll pay more so the chicken can get some fresh air. You know. He still ends up covered in breadcrumbs and deep fried. I guess it's more for our benefit, I suppose. Yeah, no, 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 no. He was happy, eh? Leave me alone. <laughs> he had a good life. I don't mind paying an extra buck or two for that. Yeah. And the meat's better, too, actually. <laughs> the meat's better. That's the rub, actually. The meat's better. I don't think we'd do it if the meat was worse, would we? Uh, what's this thing been working out? I think we should keep them cooped up like the old days. Well, it's a chicken, you know, what do we, we don't grow them to look at, at them, do we? It's a chicken. Same with rabbit, I don't know, do you eat rabbit? But if the rabbit's been all cooped up, yeah, the meat's not as good as if the rabbit's had a chance to, to hop around a bit. Or if you can get a hold of a rabbit that's been a children's pet and he's been loved and cuddled, oh, the meat, mm. the meat just falls off the bone, folks. It's, uh, Mm. Hey, you guys have been a real wonderful crowd. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming out uh, this time, folks, and we will see you next time. I'm Leland Clawson, and that's Comedy Street. Good night. Yay!